Hello everyone and thank you for joining us on another Asphalt and Rubber weekend live chat here on YouTube. I am your host, Jensen Beeler, editor of Asphalt and Rubber, and I am very lucky to have with me today Miguel Galuzzi, the head of the Piaggio Group Advanced Design Center in Pasadena, California. Hello Miguel, thank you for talking to me today. Hi Jensen, hi everybody, how are you? I'm good sir, how are you? Good, yeah in a new reality in front of us, but good, good. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a little bit of a change. Uh, I appreciate you uh, dedicating your Saturday morning to us here and uh, for all the uh, the technical things that have to go into it and for, for bearing with me. Yeah, um, this is a new way to get, to get close to each other. So <laughs> we start getting used to it. Yeah. Um, I had to actually ask what your official title was because I just know you as the motorcycle design guy. Uh, tell me for, for myself and for, for the people following, what, what exactly is your role at the Piaggio Group? What does it mean? Well, the, the, I, I was the head of design for the Piaggio Group for, uh, for I, I don't know, six, seven, eight, eight, I don't know, for a while. And at one point we, we understood uh, that we needed to think outside the box, like everybody says, you know. And outside the box at that time was not being in one place, but being, you know, whatever things happen in a different way. So I suggested to the company to to come to California because California has been always, you know, in a in a very specific it's a specific link between, you know, the east, the west, you know, the south, the north. So it's like a mixture of of many, many things that are going on that would give us would have give us a another perspective on what we needed to do. And this was like 10 years ago in 2010. And the president of Piaggio said, yeah, let's see um, you know what happened. So we opened this place here in Pasadena. And again, it's not a matter of titles, you know, to answer your question. It's a matter of understanding that we needed to step in a different direction to understand what was going on in our war, in the, the mobility industry we are in. Uh, so the idea to open the studio here was that, to create a window into something that sometimes when you are in the day-to-day, -day, daily, you know, machine doing a stuff, you have no time to do it. So we came here, as I said, you know, it's almost going to be 10 years ago, and it has given us, you know, the step on the side that allowing us to see the mobility business in a different way. Yeah, our job here is mainly to think outside the box, but also you know to help you know what's going on right now in the in the day to day too. You know we evolve into something else you know from the beginning. So right now my title is still you know motorcycle designer, and it's always going to be that. You know as I said to many many young designers that come to us you know to looking for advice, it's like. You are a motorcycle designer or whatever, but that's, you know, your main passion is that, then that's your title. My title is being, you know, my, this, my passion has always been motorcycle to wheel vehicles, you know, in many, many forms. So my title is motorcycle designer. Explain to me what like a, a, a normal day is for you, because uh... In my imagination, I, I kind of imagine you like like Donald Draper from Mad Men, where you, you kind of look for inspiration in the world. You go in, you take a movie, uh, you do something, you have a drink, and then inspiration strikes, creativity, that creative spark happens, and then it's just an intense creative process. Is that right, or is it something different? Uh, no, I don't think that the same process is in one direction. You know, it's like it happens, you know, always the same. For us, my, our our daily our day you know job is usually start at seven o'clock in the morning, because we're getting video calls. And we've been doing this thing you know with Italy for almost ten years, so we are had the advantage of talking to Italy, you know, to the people that were there, you know, from seven maybe sometimes to ten, and then we have the whole day when they go to sleep over there. We have the whole day to work. The advantage we have today, and this is thanks to technology, is that we can, we do most of the stuff digitally, and we have a, the 3D aspect of what our job is, that 
allow us to interact with engineers automatically. In the instant, you know, we are doing it. Sometimes these video calls, you know, take, you know, for an hour or two just with the screen and maybe the 3D software or the CAD and then changing and adjusting and saying, yeah, we can do that, we can. So it's like a, like a, <laughs> a continuous, you know, move forward. But going back to the, the creativity aspect, uh, my, my, my take on this is always, you know, we designers are, are a weird kind of people because we are like sponges. We have to be like sponges. So everything that happens around us gets into us and then we have to machine it and then bring it out. So it could be a movie, but it could be even, you know, just going for a walk around the street. As I told you before, you know, Pasadena has the advantage of being a, a window into, I read once, you know, it, there were like a hundred different cultures in the city. Hmm. So even just walking outside Pasadena, and if we can talk about food, you can have 50 different kind of cuisines from around the world in the same, you know, not even a square mile, you know, of space. So just that inspiration gives, you know, the idea of seeing other people and understanding that we are all in this together, but we are all very different in taste. So going back to my analogy of the sponge, you know, you have to absorb these. And whatever happens, happens. You know, most of the time, after this conversation we have in the morning and and I was telling somebody the other day about you know how the 660 for Aprilia came out came about and it was those moments in which you know the we were in Italy we were you know the day was going to an end and we were in the model shop you know talking about what we were finishing up and and we have the RSV4 there and we have you know the engines and I said that would be and this was like six seven years ago like what about if we cut the engine in half and create some? So that kind of, you know, creativity doesn't have a, a one-way road, you know, direction. So we, whatever, and again, I think the only thing I could say is that we start from the passion of what we do. And that passion, you know, creates all your brain, you know, keep on moving and moving and moving and moving and non-stopping. Which, you know, in one point, you know, to me is, is the most essential aspect. And as I told you before, you know, 10 years ago, when we say we come here, me personally as designer needed to change the way we've been working for almost, you know, in my case, you know, 20 years, mm -hmm. because we were doing the same stuff over and over again. So right now, even to think the same thing in a different way, it takes, you know, maybe some distance and some getting, you know, a big deep breath and then see what comes up. And our tool, the only tool we have is the the brain and the pen and pencil. Not even Photoshop, you know. <laughs> it's old school. No, because, it, you know, we, we, we sometimes, you know, and this is something I've seen in the last, you know, 10 years, more, more or less, is that designers, especially the younger ones, are, are not thinking with the pen, hmm. are not thinking with the pencil, are not thinking with the... You know, with just the napkin sketch, you know, the famous napkin sketch is the moment of inspiration that everybody looks to. And that's the moment everything, you know, starts. You say, but what about if? But, and then the other guy says, no, but we can do it. And then that thing starts and then never stops. <laughs> well, that's one of the things I'm curious about because for me, the, the creative process or creative minded people, I, I feel like are very different types of people when it comes to collaboration and, and working and just like corporate structures. So how do you manage, you know, a, a group of talented designers and how do you, you know, kind of like you're, how do you foster that inspiration? Because that's, that's a very, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, it is if we start thinking about it. Okay. And the process is mainly that, you know, when I, as I told you, you know, I met young designers that come to me, I says, do you need a title? Do you need somebody that tell you what to do? No. What you need to do is to challenge yourself in order to get, you know, what your brain is telling you, which sometimes is a difficult part. Now we're getting to kind of, but we know as humans that, you know, we have a very uh, 
how do you call it? The, the brain never stops. No matter what you do, huh? the, the surroundings is the one that stops us and says, oh, I cannot do that. But as a designer, in our case, you know, motorcycle designers, you, you, you are your own enemy. So there is no, and that's why, you know, sometimes they get, they, they, I get this puzzle look and say, but I'm not supposed to come here from nine to five. No, because the design process doesn't have an hour, doesn't have a schedule, doesn't have a, you know, whatever you are thinking, <laughs> it has to come out. And many people, you know, have experience, you know, working up a nice, you know, most of the time, for example, when we work, as I told you on a specific, I give you an specific example. Sometimes in these calls in the morning with Italy, we have discussions that we cannot figure it out. Then the day goes by, and then when we come back the next day, we got three better ideas than the day before. Hmm. And it's just because, you know, the process is not automatic. You know, yeah, we may get a, 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 a feeling of, yeah, we can do that. But then it may take you know, a moment in order for the brain to adjust and get better. And then, as I said, three new ideas come out. So uh, for me, the, 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 the creativity, the design process, the moments, you know, in which you can make a change are not related to something that is a closed loop. Again, the sponge is something that goes in and out and it creates a lot of stuff in and out. So that's the flexibility we need to do. And there is no constraints, you know, for that moment. Hmm. So it takes, you know, as a young designer to get this kind of feeling, it's kind of weird because you are supposed to get into a, you know, into a line and do, you know, the process in a very linear way. But to me, that's not the way to do it. It's hmm. never been and it's not going to be, ever be. Because we need, I'm not going to call it freedom because it's not a freedom. It's a pro mental process that needs you know, to have 360 degree. That has nothing to do with freedom. No? It's just a matter of, you know, it's using it, you know, to the full potential we have. Which we don't know what it is, you know, which is even more, you know, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Explain to me how you take that, that framework of working then, that, that kind of freestyle, and, and marry it to the technical side of developing a motorcycle, which I'd imagine is much more rigid and much more structured. How do you, how do you combine that left brain, right brain dynamic, and in what process in the motorcycle's mm -hmm. development do you come into it? Hey, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge, you know, of them all, but in any kind of, you know, work we do. Like I give you an example, we showed, you know, the Tuono 660 last year, in November, in ICMA, mm -hmm. and we just finished, you know, the prototype like uh, like four days before or a week before, and we knew that we were doing it. But from that moment to get that bike in production, that's where the real job is. Sure. And it has nothing to do with what we were talking about. So for a young designer, for a designer, for myself, the fun part ends, the fun part, no, the, the, the most, the freestyle part is ends there. And then is where you get, you know, the other hat and then you start getting that thing in production, which is a different type of work, but is the most important of them all because as I always said, you know, anybody can get a feeling in a piece of paper, in a rendering, but the big challenge, and this is my experience, you know, the big, and I met a few designers that can do that, from that paper, from that emotion in paper or whatever, you know, computer, to get that in production, that's where the real work of a designer is. Because you have to inter interact with 50 different departments, 50 different people, 50 mm -hmm. different opinions, but you have to keep that feeling, and that's our main job, you know, as designer, that feeling into that production bike, which is a big challenge. It could be done because it's the experience that we have. We know how we've been doing it. We have a lot of background of how we can do it. So the real job, let's call it, is that that phase. And it's just a matter, as I said, you know, getting you know all the people together and understanding yeah, we need to make a product that needs to be for the right price, for the right customer, for the right, you know, look. And so the whole things get together in one moment in which, you know, it's uh, sometimes, as we said, you know, Italians, you know, fight 
but we fight because we want to do it, you know, the best way possible. Sure. And then the result, you could see it. I so, always tell the story about the, the RS before, and I think you heard it before, and it's been almost 12 years that it's the first time in my experience in almost 30, 30 years of in the motorcycle world that the engineering department, the design department, and the racing department got together in an Italian company in order, you know, to go and win the World Superbike Championship. And we were able to get, you know, the whole people in line, and we did, you know, something that, from my point of view, it was almost impossible to do. Hmm. And that's why when you are able to do that, you see the bike has been around for, my, you know, almost 10 years. Right. Let's use that as an example because I think it's an it's an interesting one. How did how did the RSV four start? Is it a product planner that says Aprilia should make a superbike? Miguel, go draw me a superbike. Is it someone in the technical department saying, "Hey, we've got this new engine configuration. Let's build a motorcycle around it." I'm curious, like how a motorcycle gets gets birthed and where that that seed originally comes from, and then how it grows throughout the process and and when. It goes from just, uh, does it start as a sketch? Does it just, just start as a, an idea, a goal? Uh, explain yeah, it to Yeah, in, 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 I mean, we can talk about specifically in the RS before, but to answer you in a general way, uh, most of the time they are, in case of Piaggio, you know, we have a product committee, which is called, you know, that we get together, even with the people that sells the bike, and everybody pitches, you know, ideas and understands, you know, what is going on, what the market could be, what, you know, the competition is doing. So it's like a, a very, let's call creative moment in which, you know, everybody puts, you know, their ideas on ta in the table. Okay. Uh, then specifically in the, case of, in the case of the RSV4, if you, if you go, if we go back to 2005, when Aprilia was bought by the Piaggio Group, uh, Aprilia was bankrupt in 2004. They, has, they have the RSV2 en engine, you know, which was a Rotax engine. Mm -hmm. And the strategy at that time, I got into the group in 2006. So the beginning of the project was, yeah, we need to show Aprilia can do the strategy of having buying the engines, you know, was changing with the new owner, you know, going into by making our own engines because the Piaggio group has the, the capacity to do it. And then the, the, the main thing was creating something that would be, you know, the, the symbol of what Aprilia, the new Aprilia was. So it was a project that was thought as a white piece of paper and I said, well, we can do. And that's where, you know, the racing department, the design department, hmm. Even at that time, the marketing, you know, people got involved and said, well, we can do, and everybody pitched ideas. Uh, the V4 engine, you know, with a V straight V was kind of, you know, like a natural evolution of the V, you know, they had before, but it has to be packaged in a, in a thing that was kind of, a, again, we could do another RSV2 with a V4 engine. But we said, no, we need to do something else because we are at a point in which, you know, we need to show, I wouldn't call it new because there is very little new things. But in this case, was packaging this engine, which is always, you know, the problem with, especially with the two rear cylinders, you know, the mufflers and all this stuff. In a motorcycle that was, you know, the size of a 250. Mm -hmm. And again, to give you an example, that was something that, we were working at that time in, in Jorge Lorenzo's 250 Spain number one graphics. And we have the bike there in the shop and we were looking at the size. And on the other side, we had the first mm, not milled piece of engine, you know, for the before. You know, it was like a, a sketch of, of whatever that engine could be. And, you know, it was like, yeah, we were working on that and looking at the answer. But what about if we can get that engine into that? <laughs> so that, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like crazy, crazy. And that the crazy, it became your know, reality. Because, again, if you put the RS before, besides the 250, you know, of that at that time, it's a little bit wider. 
and that's it. Hmm. I remember when we presented, I think it was 2009 uh, at Misano, I think it was the presentation. And the, and the, <laughs> the press at that time said, oh, but that's too small, you know, there are not possibility to fit two people. <laughs> and I said, no, no, we try. I mean, and then we went up on the bike, you know, myself and another engineer that was as tall as me, because we thought about it, you know, I fit on the bike plus one guy on the back that was bigger almost than me, and there is space <laughs> for the bike. So that was also, you know, part of the design process. Say, yeah, we can make it small, but then I have to fit, which I'm six, almost six five. So that was also another challenge, you know, the ergonomics of the whole thing. And then we went, you know, testing, and the test riders, you know, start thinking, yeah, we can leave this. And so, uh, if I can tell you once more again, it's like in that case, the process came from a crazy idea and a very rational aspect of, yeah, we need to bring the Aprilia brand into another era to create a product that, you know, it's lasted, you know, more than 10 years. And I, you know, what I'm very proud of, you know, we, we don't have many products that do that in the industry we are in, you know, so... No, we don't. And that's, it's funny you mentioned that. Cause that's, that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about because it is rather amazing to me, especially since I have such a sport bike focus to see the longevity of the RSV four almost, I mean, it literally spans my entire career at asphalt and rubber. And, you know, to this day is still, it's still like one of the best super bikes on the market, if not the best one. So, I mean, did you, did you know that when you were working on it, you were building something special or, or did that kind of surprise you and come out of nowhere? I, I mean, do you do you get that feeling sometimes when you're when you're working on a design or a bike like this is this is something that's next level? No, I can tell you from my experience is sometimes you don't even think about that. I mean, you are just as I said at the beginning, you are challenging yourself. You know, I remember, for example, discussions now are coming to my mind. You know, discussions about how this the the frame the thickness, you know, and the testing we were doing and all these calculations and stuff, you're pushing yourself, but each of us was pushing ourselves, you know, to do, okay, this we think is the best. Let's see what happens if we go that way too. So it's like, you are not aware of something, you know, unique as the RS before, that's why it lasts so long, but you know, you're pushing yourself. And yourself meaning, you know, the team that was behind the project and not understanding which is the limit. I remember the first time we show the clay model of it. And we got everybody gathered together and I said, oh, but that's going to uh, that's going to be impossible. <laughs> and again, that's moment in which you said, oh, that's going to be impossible. I said, you're challenging yourself. Said, yeah, let's see what we can do. Instead of saying, oh, we cannot do that. Let's try and see. Hmm. And then we tried and everybody, you know, right now, every, every now and then when we get together with the people that were involved in the project, sometimes they are, you know, they are retired already. We, we look at each other and we laugh, you know, do you remember? And, and then you got a feeling that is, is different that saying, yeah, when you are in the project, in the process, you understand what you're doing. No. You understand that that moment that we push ourselves in order to do a little bit better made it possible for the last, you know, 10 years. Hmm. Because you are in a different terrain, you know, you're not doing, you know, whatever has been done before. Which again, it could be just a simple section of what the frame being could be. Was it like that with the uh, Ducati Monster? I mean, if, if people in the chat don't realize that you're you're the man behind the Ducati monster. Uh, I mean, that's probably the bike that's that's the biggest one on your resume. Uh, no, no. I, if I can tell you one thing, each project has its own history, hmm. stories, and arguments, and plus and, and cons. So, no, the monster was a completely different story because uh, the time was different, the markets were different, the the people involved in the process were different. So that was something, you know, that we're myself and another guy doing with the help of somebody inside the company that nobody knew that we were doing. And mainly it was an idea I had 
while I was working for Honda in, a, in my first job, you know, in the industry for the motorcycle industry, creating something that was out, you know, we were doing all these plastic bikes, you know, of the 80s, you know, aerodynamic cover and sea beefs. And then suddenly I saw, I, you know, we, we got all these Japanese magazines and, and this biker station magazine they usually do, and they still do, the side view, dry side view without the bodywork. And they had this picture of the, I think it was the first A51 for by Benjamin Ducati, and I just did a sketch on, on that. And, I, and then I went to my boss and said, we need to do that in the Honda. I said, yeah, yeah, go, go. But then the sketch, you know, came back, came coming back. Then I went to work for Kajio. And then I think it was the first day, you know, I got to meet, you know, Castiglione in my interview. I said, yeah, we need to do this bike. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe someday. And then I kept on showing, you know, to my boss, you know, yeah, we need to do this bike until a summer. I think it was 1990 or something like that. But I had nothing to do. I said, can I do this? Said, yeah, let's go, do it. Go, go, go. And the rest is history because that's you know the way it was born. Hmm. Because again, uh, at that moment there was, as a motorcyclist, I had this need, this drive or understanding that I needed very basic few things, you know, to have to do the same thing that at that time all these super bikes, you know, very expensive stars were were doing. Remember, we are talking about you know the end of the eighties, you know, in which you have interceptors, GXXRs, you know, the A51s were coming out and the new superbike era was starting. So my last Japanese bike that I bought was in 83, was a GS 750 ES of 1983. The first one with 16 inches wheels and, but all this plastic, you know, that didn't make much sense. So my thinking, you know, and I was at that time I was in school here in Pasadena, and we would go to the Los Angeles Crest Highway with this friend that had a Triumph T hundred. And then there was another guy with an interceptor. And at the end of the day, you know, he would be always behind us and having more fun than everybody else. <laughs> so I said, you know, all these things, you know, at the end, you know, the idea is what do I actually need, you know, to do? And the story about, you know, the hunter, but the gas tank and, a, and an engine and a seat start. That's the basic of what we have in the motorcycle forever, you know. Then we got, you know, very sophisticated and we started doing a lot of stuff. But that's what mainly we need, you know. Hmm. I think you and I have had a, more than a few conversations about what the, the motorcycle industry needs and what the trends are. I'm curious, though. Now that we've gone through this this you know global pandemic, does that change your outlook on where the motorcycle industry needs to head and what kind of bikes need to be produced? Is it is it cheaper bikes, more basic bikes like the Monster? Is it are we in that kind of time again? Uh, to me, it doesn't make any difference because we've been doing we we've been pushing for this for, I mean, the Piaggio Group founds itself in a very unique position. Because we've been talking about this, and, and again, the 660 Aprilia is an example. Having more than cheap or whatever, affordable stuff for a new client that, yeah, he may want to have fun, he may need to commute, but you don't need all the stuff that we had. And it's not because of this pandemic. Huh? This is already, you know, what we were already thinking, and if we are going to go, to go forward. You know, we're going to have the same fun and if we are talking about the RS before, with their RS660 in a different way. And this is, for example, something that Aprilia in their own, you know, DNA has. You know, remember, maybe you, you are too young, but when Aprilia did the 500, the 500 GP with a two cylinder with the, against the four cylinders, and they were in certain conditions that the bike was faster than everybody else. So, even that little thinking of that, that's crazy. Oh, that's impossible. No, Aprilia did it, and he showed, you know, that the concept was right. So you don't need sometimes, you know, all the stuff. No, yeah, in certain conditions, we need it. You can go to the track, you can have, you know, 250 horsepower. But then the world 
has been going on in that direction for, from my point of view, for 10 years. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of time getting there. Hmm. Like for example, the only thing I see is that this thing we are going through right now is going to accelerate that thing. Because we are going to come out on the other side. Do I need that? That's going to be the first, you know, thing. Before it was kind of, do I need that? And then you forget about it, what you were thinking. Right now, it's going to make it more important, more essential to say, do I need that? No, I can do it with that. I can go, you know, around town with a scooter. I can go, you know, yeah, I can buy a motorcycle that is cheaper, half or whatever, you know, a car is. So we are, you know, we are accelerating. I see it as an accelerator. That's all. Like a pressure. More than pressure is, you know, this thing, these moments, you know, in human history makes, you know, the changes, you know, big changes that we are trying to avoid. These things help us, you know, make it faster. So from my point of view and the industry we are in, we are in a good position, you know, to do what people actually need to to move around, to go to work, to, to do, you know, what we've been doing. And, without even thinking you know, further than you know, a couple of months ahead. So this thing for sure is going to make us think maybe five years from now, 10 yeah. years from now. Things that didn't make any sense, you know, not many any sense. They were kind of, okay, yeah, let me think in another time. They make it more you know, important to think right now. That's a, that's a curious thing to me because where we are now is the, the designing process or the thinking process behind the motorcycles that we'll see in five years uh, or, or, or so around about that amount of time. Do you think that's going to change significantly the type of bikes that we're going to see? Is that changed your thinking on what you were going to design? I, I guess it's a little different between what Piaggio is doing and what the industry is doing as a whole, but I'm curious if, if five years from now, we're going to see a better reflection of what, you know, COVID-19 has brought to our consciousness. I think so, uh, and I'm going to repeat myself. But you know, in the case the Piaggio, the Piaggio people, we've been doing this for quite a while, and I'm not talking about the last ten years. Huh? You know, the Piaggio group in itself. You know, even if we go back to in history, you know, the Vespa, seven years ago was the best example of what we're talking. There was a moment in which, you know, after World War II, people needed to move, mm -hmm. and it was a moment in which, you know the history of the world changed suddenly like that. And then, you know, the idea of having creating this thing that still around. And as I, as you know, you know, we have right now the Vespa electric. I mean, it was already a year and a half, from, but you see that's, we were already thinking that. Mm -hmm. So we are in a moment in which, yeah, we're going to keep on seeing it for us. Yeah. The 660 is the best example of something that we already you know, the feeling of understanding that people, you know, the new clients that we are looking into, for example, here, you know, the 25 to 30, 30 year olds that are going to have to move. You can go into, you know, into a 20 or 660 very easily. And it's something that you can afford. We were talking with a friend the other day about changing, you know, the rare tire in an RSV4 or a, a super bike that you need to do. If you use it in the street, you know, every three months, you have to pay in three hundred, three hundred dollars, you know, to change the tire. Mm -hmm. These bikes that we are making, you know, the tires are more affordable, so they could be ninety, a hundred. So it's a quarter, you know, forty percent of what you're spending now. The service of the engine is going to be long, so the whole living experience with the product is going to be better. But my, you know, going back to the the the, the COVID nineteen. It's not because of that. It's because we were already thinking about it. Hmm. You know, the market, you know, the market in itself. We can talk about, you know, the competition, you know, what was going on with Harley before this. Uh, <laughs> it's clear that the market needed to change. We've been talking about it. We've been doing stuff, but this is going to accelerate this process. Hmm. Seems of like course. I always... So, uh... <laughs> It seems like I always well, run into you at, at bike shows. Um, coming yeah, back to that, yeah. that, that, that idea for inspiration. 
what what do you what do you look for when you're when you're at a show in terms of like assessing the the work of other designers you know what what makes a good design to you or what makes it a good design to me is the simple is you know now i'm gonna quote mr dieter rams you know i is the no design of it which is the most difficult aspect of it right now we are in a phase of over designing stuff because we have no better and that's what's that this is one thing is going to end no doubt about it we are over designing stuff because we don't know what to do what the what we need to do in order to make people buy our product so the excuse is yeah we over design it because that's the only thing we have because the engineering is pretty common you know suspensions you know brakes and frames and and the design is the only, the last card that remained there, you know, in order to, oh, this is the new one. Like, who, who cares? So from a point of view, a good design is the simplicity of it. The lack of, you know, I give you an example. And that's why, you know, when we said we met at shows, you know, uh, I came to the U.S., as I told you, you know, 10, 10 years ago, and the common knowledge in Europe, you know, in the, all these um, committees was that the young people didn't like motorcycles anymore. Hmm. You know, the PlayStation yeah. thing that, yeah, they prefer yeah. video games and stuff. I remember getting here and my son was in school at the time. So I was commuting. Then my wife was here too. I'm meeting friends that they were riding motorcycles that were not in any kind of, you know, statistic and was mainly you know buying old bikes fixing it up somehow and go and ride you know the hell out of them but those bikes they are not in any number of statistics in any kind of survey or anything like that so going back to that moment i said but no this is not true this is and it's already been you know almost than 10 years you know if you think about the one motor show the hand built show the wheels and waves, you know, that, that was the first moment in which I understand that there was going, something was going on that we were not looking as an industry, but as a motorcyclist, I can relate to. And that's when people said, I, I don't give a damn about what they're doing in the industry. I do my own. Mm. And that's where the moment he said, this is not true that young kids don't like motorcycles. This is a, a, a big lie that we are not looking into precisely what we actually need to do hmm. that was the moment for example i give you an example the v7 the racer was born out of that and that was 2009 i think too you know like long time ago mm -hmm. because we knew that we can do it as a manufacturer you are limited because of homologations you know safety and all the stuff but we can show you the way in a very very easy way and that's why, you know, going to these shows to me gave them a, a new window into something that still the passion for motorcycles. And I can give you examples of my grandfather, my father, my uncle. The passion has always been there. And it's the same. Once you get into a two wheel vehicle and you go for a ride and you understand what it's about, then you're hooked for life. <laughs> for life. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, where do you look for in terms of bellwethers to, to see where the, the industry could be heading? Is, do you look at the automotive sector? Do you look at fashion? Is it music? Is it something else? Obviously you're at shows. Where else are you drawing kind of like your, your data for, for what's going to be cool? <laughs> what is going to be cool? Nobody knows. <laughs> we can create it. No, because again, it's, you know, to be cool is like is like, like a, it lasts five seconds. The way we are living today, hmm. to me, is something that could last, which is more difficult to do. Could last meaning is meaningful to the buyer and to the client. So my inspiration is around. <laughs> That's why, you know, going to the shows as where we meet and stuff like that is one. But then just walking in the street. You know, for example, I give you something that I noticed here in where I live in Pasadena. I never seen so many people walking on the street in Pasadena 
in the whole you know, time I've been here. And I understand that people walking in the street like they've been doing in the last two or three months, they are discovering something that they never experienced in the last maybe 10 years or 15. Mm -hmm. And understanding that if you walk, you can go to places and see that what's going on around you in a different way. You know, we live in a city that you get in a car and then you go to buy you know, groceries, even though it's maybe a half a mile away. So getting into that thing and seeing it, you say, yeah, we're going to understand that people from a couple of years from now, they're going to understand that they can walk. I was reading this morning that they are in Italy right now, they are closing certain areas in downtown, in downtowns, in cities, mm -hmm. so people can walk on bicycle. Mm -hmm. The same in Seattle. And I was reading, you see, and hopefully in Portland, they're going to do it. They are talking about it in LA. So that's when people are rediscovering things that they were there, but you know, they were so evident that you didn't care about it. But right now that thing, that is, you know, little, you know, when you see a, a plant coming out that is very little like that, it's coming out. I give you another example. When I got here, we got, you know, an office in the main street in Pasadena in the first floor, and we had a big window. And I remember 2010, getting to the office, you know, at 30 in the morning like that, opening the, the drapes and seeing all these kids riding bicycle. 20 something year olds riding bicycle in Pasadena. 15 years before you would be crazy if you were riding a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. In, in Los Angeles, riding a bicycle. I mean, riding a bicycle today in LA is, is kind of almost, I wouldn't call it normal, but you know, many people are doing it. So, Seeing all these people walking in the street in Pasadena and neighborhoods and stuff, it's like going back in history. No, we are rediscovering something that is very simple and very long lasting thing. So that is going to influence me as a designer to understand that maybe we need to do, I give you one, but you know, lighter vehicle. Hmm. Hmm. Lighter vehicles, maybe do we need all the things? No. Safety, safety, the only concern. Yeah, maybe. How do we do it? Oh, that's impossible. <laughs> then let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that transitions me pretty well into one of the questions we got in the chat, and I would encourage everyone uh, watching to get some questions on the chat room. We'll take them. We'll take them now. Um, but Chantal, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He he says, "Hi, Miguel. Huge fan of your work." What's your take on existing performance electric motorcycles? Where do you think motorcycle design is headed with performance uh, electric bikes? This is something you and I have had a lot of words about, but maybe you can rehash it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh, to me, the, the, the performance, again, I, the first, I was very skeptical of electric motorcycles until 2011, I think it was. Uh, we went to the canyons here to test the mission. Mm -hmm. That was the last, you know, incarnation of that project that was, and I went for a ride and I changed my mind because that's, that was a unique experience of riding a two wheel vehicle. And I was with my son that at that time he had a, you know, he was there with his monster S4 RS 200 a million horsepower and all this stuff. That, that, that. Then he went into even into riding that bike. I said, "Oh, sh wow! There is something here." That's a good bike. And the story, yeah, uh, you know, and the story, and the story about oh, it doesn't have the noise because he was the first, you know, all oh, the mm. twin cylinder noise and stuff. The noise of that vehicle was completely different. So the whole experience was new. And even you know, I, I ride, I rode, you know, I ride lots of bikes. This was was a completely different experience. The only problem was the weight. So I remember getting out of the bike and saying, if you are able to do a quarter of everything you have here, I have the same kind of performance because of weight, then you are into something. Hmm. And that's why right now, I think we are looking into, we are still the performance electric motorcycles are going you know, too much into the, yeah, we need a lot of horsepower because that was the thinking of the old generation of superbikes. Hmm. You know, we have today hmm. MotoGP 200 and 100 million horsepower. Yeah. 
Then they have the problem that the tires don't follow, and then the friend. So it's like the never ending story. But this one, who start from a different point of view and create the same kind of performance or the same kind of you know, feeling, but with a lot less. Then we get into the, the area in which we can be, you know, completely autonomous of everything we do with the electric power. And that's, you know, the next step of what we are talking about, which is not related to performance, but to a more, to a more, you know, like, like I was saying before, like walking on the, on, on the neighborhood and understanding what's going on. Yeah. I think you bring up, um, an interesting point for me, at least has always been what autonomous vehicles are going to do for motorcycles. And, and to your point earlier, we're seeing a I'll, lot of kind of crossover machines that are not quite cars and not quite bikes that are rethinking the way transportation's going to be in the future. I mean, how do you, how do you read that for motorcycles? Oh, the autonomous thing. Yeah. Wow. Uh, if, no, <laughs> I having a, a hard time not dealing because I'm not dealing with it, but thinking about it because you can have, and one thing is, you know, for example, we can think about the ABS cur you know, uh, turning ABS. Mm -hmm. which is a safety feature that the electronics we have today and the sensors can give us a, a hand in handling, just like ABS did, you know, 20 years ago. But from there, all the way to an autonomous vehicle, I mean, you should stay home and walk. <laughs> then if we go into a motorcycle, then we forget about it. You know, forget about it because, as I said, Riding a motorcycle is a very physical activity. And it's not related only to the physics, but it's only to the, the two parts of the brain. The feelings you get when you ride a motorcycle in nature, it could be an electric, it could be whatever, you don't get with any kind of other thing in the world. Then I can understand somebody sitting in a car and getting into an autonomous mode, uh, mode for 10 miles. And that's like the, you know, the cruise control, you know, four years ago, it was like, wow, that's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. But this is a different story. Getting into the autonomous thing, that's for, for Disneyland. <laughs> and they've been doing the autonomous thing. No, no, no. I remember, you know, Disneyland did this monorail, autonomous whatever, 50 years ago. Then that thing became, you know, very popular, maybe more, I don't know. But I, I don't know why you're asking me, popular. I wasn't there. <laughs> no, that's why. But, you know, if you think about the technology Disney War in Orlando did, that was one thing. No, here in, in Anaheim. Then that thing got into airports, and eventually we're going to get that autonomous, whatever you want to call it, into the cities. Hmm. For sure once we understand that we don't need all these cars in the city. Hmm. But we need lighter vehicles that are going to allow us, you know, to live you know, the city more. So the autonomous thing for motorcycles, if you are talking about the motorcycles that are emotional, you know, they, they use, you know, the more romantic aspect of our brain, I don't see it. I see maybe, you know, we have in Piaggio, we have the Gita which is a, 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 a backpack that follows you and understands who you are. And then you bring the stuff with you without having to, you know, having a shoulder pain and stuff like that. But that's a different story, you know. It's not related to what we, we have right now as a, as, a, as a motorcycle, let's call it motorcycle, but, you know, a two-wheel vehicle, you know, with their own, their own power. I see a trend of, of manufacturers wanting to always add more and more electronics, more and more complex features. Do you think there's room for a movement to, to get back to just basic motors and chassis, kind of like what we've seen with a, a Royal Enfield or a Ural or, or maybe some of the other brands out of uh, Asia? Uh, I have a, a commenter asking about cheaper production motorcycles without rider aids. Uh, you know, the, the problem with electronics is that they are cheap. They are not expensive. Huh. So 
Uh, and that's another part, you know, everybody's missing, you know, the, the electronics of everything we're talking, even when we go to, I mean, one thing, the automotive industry is going electric because it's cheaper than having all these other technologies. Then we can say, it depends the way we use that thing. And, and as I said before, the sensors, for example, with the electronics we can create, yeah, we can make, you know, the vehicle safer for different, a wider range of people. But then going to simpler doesn't mean that we don't need, you know, the electronics. Hmm. You know, the electronics right now, as I said, they are simple stuff, common, cheaper, then the way we use it. Yeah, for example, I'll give you an example. The RSV4, the electronics that we have to put in the RSV4 is because it has to be ridden by 360 degree riders. Then if you go to, you know, to the bike, you know, that, that we have in MotoGP, the electronics, you know, it may be four things, you know, that they need because of the rider. So what I mean is, you know, the application of these electronics is what makes the difference. Hmm. The traction control, yeah, most people, don't, I don't like it, but there is a lot of new riders that don't understand that they have this feature and they like it. So uh, the simplicity, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, the competition, not necessarily, I mean, traction control, it comes almost cheap for free with the electronics we have today. Yeah. Is it a help? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, most in most cases, you know, people don't understand what, you know, sleeping the rear wheel in certain conditions is going to do. So no. I don't I don't want to make it, you know, easier, but you know, the electronics needs to be that's our point. Understanding where to put it, what the need of the client is going to be, and then uh, choosing, you know, what you need to do, what you need to put in the product. I see uh, Josh Marsh is asking if you get to ride a lot of uh, competitor spikes as a part of your research. What's your, what's your opposition uh, research look like? No, not as much as I would like. You know, I usually have to do it when I go to Italy because we have, you know, the bikes there. Uh, but uh, I haven't, I haven't rode a, a lot lately because I'm more into, and this is a personal phase, you know, in which, you know, I'm more into fixing stuff, you know, getting getting into my old bike stuff and restoring and cleaning and fixing and doing that kind of thing because it's a moment in which, you know, you go, and I was telling a friend the other day, I was looking into uh, super bikes of the 80s, which to me was the moment in which, you know, just like motocross was in the 70s, you know, all the these crazy uh, testing and trying and making and doing and and those were crazy moments in which you know everything was possible and if you think about from 76 all the way to the 85 time all that period of the super bikes you know that we had at that time they were one crazier than the other one and if you look into how they were doing it I was researching, you know, the, the katanas, you know, Yoshimura raced, mm -hmm. you know, in the 80s, you know, it was the first 16 valve engine in 82 and it didn't work. And, but each race, the bike, if you were able to get the pictures, was completely different from the next race. Even the riding position, the everything, the setup, completely different. And the other guys were doing the same stuff. Because it was, you know, an experimenting phase in which nobody had a clear picture of what they were doing. They knew that they were had to do fast, mm -hmm. but they didn't know how to do this, how to make these heavy, big things go fast. Yeah. So that was, you know, a moment in which, you know, they were test doing whatever, whatever it took, you know. You said something interesting there about, you know, how your personal kind of phase with motorcycles is, is being able to work on them. And I think that's, that's a big part of motorcycling for, for people, or at least for a certain group yeah. of people. But yeah. I, I feel like the industry trend as a whole, and we certainly see it in the automotive side, is to make a product that people can't work on in their own garage. You need to have a special computer to talk to the, 
ECU, you have all these electronics. I mean, is there ever an idea in your head to just be like, let's just make something that that's like adult Legos, you know, that's something that like a fairly <laughs> mechanically capable person, which would not be me. Um, I should never be allowed to touch a wrench, but someone that could take it apart and put it back together again, type of approach. There, there is, there is only one problem with that. And that's because, you know, what you're saying about the industry, sorry, is related to the, the homologations of the bike. Hmm. Like for example, most of the things that we need to do as manufacturers is because of the, the, the homologation laws that tells you that you cannot tweak a, a carburetor, you cannot change you know, the brakes, you cannot change the muffler, you cannot change. So the manufacturer follows that, but going in the direction you're talking about is more <laughs> related to the old bikes you know, we used to have. So I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Maybe when we are talking about alternative, you know, vehicles, like, for example, we we're talking about ele electric bikes, maybe that's going to be a new field of it. Because, again, this, then it starts, you are not getting your hands dirty, but you're getting your, your brain because you are working with software instead of parts. That's when the things get, you know, in a different, in a new perspective. You know, I always have the image, I remember as a kid, you know, having the image of my father or my grandfather with a screwdriver working in, in the carburetor. And this is an image, you know, as a kid, you know, I said, well, what are they doing? You know, they are opening, you know, the air of the carburetor and adjusting. And this is something that for sure is gone. But what we are talking about is, you know, be able to code, you know, whatever you have in mind at the time, which... In your case, you can relate more to. That's maybe you know where we are heading. Still, the old bikes are going to have to be tweaked and cleaned and you know prepared and refurbished and re and rebuilt, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a different story. Uh, I see uh, Steve Cameron is asking about the uh, the six hundred and sixty adventure bike. Uh, I was in Eichma when when you guys were. We're showing the the concept for that, or, or not showing the concept, as it were, because it was a giant box full of plants, and uh, you had to be very very crafty on what you could see and what you couldn't see. I mean, can you can you shed a little bit more more light onto that machine for me, or can you tease us with maybe some of the ideas you have from uh, a design perspective? Uh, I want to see how much trouble I can get you in, Miguel, before we get off the chat. No, 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 no. There is no trouble. It's coming. I mean, we are doing it. We are working and we are testing. You know, so it's coming. And this is just the same family of engine that is going to go in another direction. So as usual, you know, Aprilia always have these kind of, you know, two lives into the brand, which is, and this is not many people know that Aprilia in reality started as a motocross brand. Mm -hmm. You know, they raced, you know, for a long time, you know, motocross, 125, 250s, you know, in Europe for a long time, then they became, you know, a road racing brand. So these two souls into the brand are there. So, and that's what we are trying to do. Right now we have, you know, the RS660, which is, you know, the RSV4 family. And then we're going to have this Enduro 21 inches wheel vehicle that is going to be, I tell you, quite unique. What's and right now we are in the face it? of... What is unique about it is that, again, uh, Aprilia, and, I, and we go back to, you know, the, the RS before the modern time of Aprilia, even mm -hmm. the RS 660, I can tell you, you know, until two years ago, until we presented at IGMA in 2019, everybody was kind of, you know, I don't know, I don't know. From that moment on, all the, the doubts, because everybody went crazy, said, well, that's... That's what, you know, what we need. Yeah. And this is not the people from the factory. It's what the clients that were there say, wow, that's, and not only, you know, the 40-year-old, you know, even the 21-year-olds, you know, were there and say, well, that's what we need. Because this is more than enough, you know, for this moment we are living in. And going back to the, the, the Enduro we are talking about, we are trying to do the same. 
So once you get there, this thing is going to be an Aprilia. Oh, mm. from Aprilia that is going to be able to do, you know, lots of things that the other ones are kind of, you know, trying to find the compromise that a bike that can do everything is always a problem. In this case, we have the advantage of having the engine, having a, a mechanical layout that is going to allow us, yeah, to do an enduro, that you're going to be able to travel around the world whenever you want, but we are not stopping there. Hmm. So to answer your question, we are doing an Aprilia <laughs> okay. in the enduro field, okay. which means, you know, it, it could have no meaning, but there is a lot of meaning there, which may be for another interview. <laughs> I'll have to wait a little bit longer. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know how the, the 660 platform came to be. You know, you took the RSV4 and you lopped off the back cylinders. Um, but we do see a trend in the industry with parallel twins versus, you know, kind of getting away from the V-twins. You know, what do you think about that? Do you, do you think the parallel twin's a great platform? Or do you miss the V-twin? What are your thoughts? No, the, the advantage of having a, a parallel uh, twin is that the package of the bike you could do, you have more more flexibility. Hmm. You know, going back to to having a cylinder that is on the back, it's always been a problem, especially for riders, for the rider, because the cylinder on the back is always, you know, creating a, a dimension, even, you know, and this is going to be sound like almost banal, but for lo short people, you know, to be able to touch the ground, and having a cylinder on the back makes you know the bike wider. So if you if you have a tall seat and you're gonna make it narrower so you can touch the ground, that's for example a problem. The advantage mm -hmm. for that's the first one that comes to mind. But you know then if we talk about you know what the 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 production is cheaper because you're working only you know one block of aluminum mm -hmm. instead of two difference you know having a symmetric asymmetric stuff. So there is a lot of advantages, but in our case, it was like kind of a, like a natural uh, thing to do to get, okay, we got this great engine, let's use the front part. Then we have the other advantage. Yeah, we are not going to say no, but yeah, there are other advantages. But the beginning of the idea was like that. Hmm. Because the concept was, okay, we have all this thing, can we do half of it and see what happens? I'm interested, or it's interesting to me that, you know, we're seeing the Piaggio group bikes kind of adopt this platform strategy more. You see the V85 platform coming out for Moto Guzzi. You see the 660 platform coming out for Aprilia. I'm kind of curious why we haven't seen the V4 motor from the RSV4 in more bikes than just Tuono, because you have this kind of masterpiece bike and then you kind of, you didn't really do whole much with it. Why, why isn't there a long travel suspension version of the Tuono? Why isn't there a Dorzo Duro version of the V4? Why can't you just put that motor in a blender? Because I would buy it if you put it in a blender. No, I, I would buy literally should, anything I, you put that motor in. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you said, you said it. It, it. That's a masterpiece. You don't want to mess with a masterpiece. <laughs> because every time you, you mess with a masterpiece, then you destroy it. Hmm. And this is a very simple answer, but that's mostly who's going to buy a, a dorso duro with a B4 with to do what? Just get speeding tickets. <laughs> but uh, have you ridden the Tuono? Yeah. Why no, do you I need have. a super motor? Uh, you know, I know, but that's why <laughs> you had the Tuono. But, but, but okay, so so maybe not the dorso duro, but. I mean, there's obviously a market for bikes like the BMW S1000XR, Ducati Multistrada. There's there's tons of bikes in these categories that you could have done something with that motor. You don't think so? A market. No. I mean, we can get into numbers and then you're going to we're going to laugh. Okay. Because that's, you know, that's another problem we have in our industry right now. You think you can do with one thing a hundred things because that's the way you know the marketing tells you you know how to do it but at the end of the day the buyers and that's why going back to original you know conversation the buyers are always the same for that kind of thing 
you know, the buyers that are buying, you know, the, the multi-strat are the people that cannot, you know, ride anymore on you know, the super bike. So we are, what are we are most interested in right now is getting the new buyers into the market, mm -hmm. which you're not going to find, you know, with a dorso duro four cylinder of twenty five thousand dollars. You know what? No. No, we need to. That's why, you know, my my job has always been that, you know, trying to understand what the client needs. And again, the client changes. Hmm. And the, the thing we have is the motorcycles haven't changed. So the client changes, is asking for something, and we are not listening. I'm talking about 10 years ago. And I, I go back to the example of the V7 racer. That created a platform, you know, the V7, V7 as a platform for Gucci that has been going on for 10 years. Mm -hmm. For 10 years, a long time. I don't know exactly, you know, the year, but it's been a long time. But because, you know, we understood that at that moment, the client was changing. And I tell you a story because it was, to me, it was a, a moment in which they said, wow. I remember 2008, or no, 9 or 10, it was to 11, going to Pro Italia, to the dealer, you know, I have close home mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And they are good sea dealers. And I was there, you know, uh, talking to the to Bill, you know, Nation, you know, the owner. We were talking about it. And then suddenly he said, oh, let me introduce you to this, I don't remember his name, that just bought a, a V7. And he, I think it was a racer. He said, oh, this is a beautiful bike. And and I asked him, I, I, do, do you understand, I mean, what do you know about the brand? No, I don't know anything. But it's just a beautiful bike. And I just rode it, and it's more than enough that I need. So I said to him, go to the internet. Then we meet, you know, next week here. Go and understand what the brand means. And then the next week when we got together, he was, he's going to be a Moto Guzzi fan for the rest of his life. Because, again, we are not talking about something that is nice, affordable at that time. was. Yeah? It's a whole bunch of, you know, 100-year-old, you know, brand that has been doing all this stuff, you know, for a long time. So the tradition, the knowledge the, is there. Hmm. And that's not something that everybody has, you know. No, it's certainly not. Uh, it is interesting to see so where, where the, we're headed. The, pla the, pla the platform, uh, to answer your question, the platform, I think it's just a matter of understanding and it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic aspect of it. You know, we can create four different things and then maybe the client is there. I'll give you an example again. The, 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 the California, when we did it in 2007, I think it was the project started. In reality, the variations of the project was, were eight different ones. Hmm. Because again, the California was Original was for a certain buyer that you know, was the nostalgic one, that new and they had the old one. But then we have the new ones that you know that could, they could remember. For example, in the U.S., El Dorado was more important than the California. That for some people in the motorcycle world, they don't even remember what it was. In, it, in Europe, for example, El Dorado didn't exist, but here in the U.S., was more important than the V7. Hmm. at that time. Huh? We're talking about old stuff right now. And the last one of the series was the the Flying Fortress, which was, you know, the crisis of them all. Yeah. But you, you see, we went from, because that's the way we are thinking, you know, if you are creative enough, you know, okay, we got this argument, which is the California. We are not going to stop there. We go all the way to whatever, you know, we think it could be for 10 years. And that's the only way we've been thinking, you know, I don't know, to going back to the monster, you know, the monster was only the beginning of something. Hmm. But then Ducati didn't understand it, you know, they, then, you know, they split, so whatever. But that was the beginning of something. And mainly was to get out of the box of the other you know, racing motorcycle, which at that time they were only thing, you know, they were doing. Right. And it was just a platform to create. Then whatever happened, happened. The rest is history. 
It is. Uh, Miguel, I think we're just about out of time. So I wanted to, to thank you for okay. spending your Saturday morning with us. And I wanted to thank everyone in the chat for, for giving us questions. It's always a, a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Yeah, me too. Uh, that's it. We can talk one day about Aprilia's DNA if you want. That's yeah. a long story. <laughs> the next time I see you, yeah. We'll have to get a okay. drink. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you again, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you, you too. And bye-bye to everybody. Bye. And please click Bye. Uh, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you again next week, everyone. Bye.